Hello, everyone. We are going to give it just a few minutes for the room to populate. But we appreciate everyone being timely per usual. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as we get ready. Okay, well, I'm gonna slow, go ahead and slowly get started just because this is a full packed program today. Um, but we are here today for another C2C care webinar. Uh, today's program is about OSHA's on-site consultation program. We'll be running from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern, so about 60 minutes. We'll have our presentation and then we should have a short Q&A period afterwards. Um, I'm gonna go through a couple of quick introductory slides and then we will go ahead and get into our program today. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. Um, that is the email you can reach me at if you need to reach me for anything during the program, before, during, or after. Um, I am located in Silver Spring, Maryland. So I definitely hope our audience will go ahead and say where they're located. Um, we're doing a normal kind of interesting DC area spring right now, where right now it's 60 degrees outside. And I think over the weekend, it's gonna be 90. So it's, it's a normal kind of interesting time to be. Uh, located in this area of the country. If you're joining us for the first time, we are Connecting to Collections Care. This is our home on the web, uh, connectingtocollections.org. On that website, you will find all sorts of fun information, including a past history of all of our webinars that we've done. Uh, C2C Care has been, over for, been around for over 10 years, so you will find quite the library of uh, webinars there. We also have our courses, which are a little bit more in-depth look at um, different subjects within the collection sphere. So again, I would encourage you to go dig around in there if you want to. The courses are kind of interesting because we do charge for them when they're live and for the first year after they've been kind of produced. But after that first year, they are free. So there's a nice big, huge archive of courses as well. We also have our community link. Uh, the community is there for anyone in the collections community to ask questions of a fabulous group of volunteer monitors who will then go reach out to experts to answer questions about direct collections care. So I would encourage you to go check that out. We also have our resources on the website. So it's a deep place over there. So I would encourage you to go visit it. We have two homes on social media where we do regular announcements. One is Facebook and the other one is on the network formerly known as Twitter. Um, our handle on both is at C2C Care. For today, you will be able to interact with our uh, presenters through the chat function, which it looks like people are already doing, so you guys know how to do that. The chat is a great place to say hello, uh, where you're located, that kind of information. We are also enabling the Q&A box today. I would encourage you that if you have a question at any point during the presentation, please do use that Q&A box. Um, the Q&A box is really there for questions. It helps us track things. So again, if you have a question, Q&A box, if you just want to say hello or make a quick comment, chat box is the place to go. We've also enabled closed captioning for this webinar. So if you would like to open that up, you can hit the CC button. We have our captioner working hard away right now. So we appreciate their time and effort as well. Well, quick programming notes for C2C Care. Um, we keep filling up our schedule and the biggest thing we have coming up soon is all of our May Day programming. FAIC celebrates every year May Day where you can do one event to celebrate kind of preparing yourself for emergency and emergency preparedness. I'm gonna be putting a link in the chat in a little bit, but as usual, they are doing a raffle where you can get all sorts of fun emergency type things like the salvage wheel or maybe a free registration for a C2C Care course later this fall. So again, if you can report that you've done one thing for emergency preparedness, you can enter yourself for that raffle. Our programming for May Day, our first one's on May 1st, is all about regional emergency networks with VACDARN, response to Vermont's se severe weather and flooding. And on May 30th, we have a webinar all about earthquake preparedness. So we're pretty excited to celebrate May Day with everyone with a, with a packed full month of fun stuff to talk about, all related to emergency and emergency response. And then on June 4th, we have a webinar scheduled for practical strategies for the care of film and glass negatives. All those are free. We do one free webinar a month. So we encourage you guys to go and register for those if you are interested. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first two presenters today. Their names are Ann Bracker. She's manager of the Connecticut Onsite Consultation Program and Savita Trevedi, who's the industrial hygienist. They're gonna be talking a little bit just about what is OSHA's onsite program. 
Um, and then we'll have the second part of our presentation where we're going to have some actual kind of site reviews and kind of what happened on sites later on in this hour. So Anne and Savita, feel free to take over whenever you are ready. Thank you so much. And you're going to have to turn off your camera there just for a second. You were popping again for your audio, if you don't mind. Okay, and let me get going from the first slide. And head back to the top here. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Okay, thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? Loud and Audio clear. Is okay. so, yep, you sound okay. great, so feel free. Terrific. So thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you today about OSHA's on-site consultation program. I'm the program manager of on-site consultation in Connecticut. I'm joined by Savita Trivedi, an industrial hygienist who's uh, a consultant who's focused on museum hazards as, as one of the industries that she's evaluated as an on-site consultant. And we will be sharing with you the an overview of this program, which is available to all private sector employees and many public sector employees in um, uh, the, the country. Um, people hear the word OSHA and they think, oh my gosh, I don't want to participate. It's, it's probably OSHA's best kept secret, this program. It's um, as I'll describe in the upcoming slides, if I can get the slide to move, um, it's, it's a program that um, benefits employers because we can help you identify and control workplace hazards to prevent work-related injuries, illnesses, and fatalities. Um, workers employed by museums and cultural heritage sites or those that may respond to emergencies at these settings may be exposed to occupational hazards. Museums have to follow OSHA regulations, but these regulations can be difficult to understand. So OSHA's on-site consultation program is available to you to offer free confidential occupational safety and health services to help you meet these regulations. Consultants with the on-site program are not enforcement inspectors. Consultants will work with you, the employer, to identify workplace hazards, develop safety and health programs, and provide advice for compliance with OSHA standards. And in return for your commitment to implementing the recommendations, the consultants will continue to work with you. Um, there's no cost. Um, we can train your staff conduct exposure monitoring, help you write job hazard analyses, and suggest cost-effective control uh, strategies. After we're done describing the program and, and some of the nuts and bolts and what we've seen during visits, you're gonna have the chance to hear from um, two um, folks who have worked with on-site consultation, one an EHNS manager and another a curator. So you'll see how this program um, actually look what it looks like in the real world. The benefits in summary to using on-site consultation is that you have the opportunity to work with an experienced safety professional. There are no penalties, it's confidential, and we're separate from This slide summarizes a number of the safety and health topics that consultants can address. So what's important is that if you ask for an on-site consultation, you can define the scope. You may feel that you're very comfortable with um, your approach to hazard communication, et cetera, but you might need help with your protective equipment selection, or maybe you have a process that you're worried has an air contaminant of concern that you'd like a consultant to think about with you. You're able to address the, the hazards and, and topics that you would like the consultant to focus on, or you can request a more general overview. The hazards in collection care are numerous, therefore there are a number of different ways on-site consultation can assist you. Um, there are a number of publications that your organizations have published, and I know your organizations have had a, a, a variety of ha um, presentations on occupational hazards and collection care. 
but some of the select topics that you might be interested in having a consultant work with you on would include formaldehyde, some of the radio radioactive dyes, some of the pigments that might contain toxic metals, silica dust, mold, paints, epoxy, solvents, or pesticides. And those working on exhibit preps, et cetera, might be exposed to physical hazards, like working at heights or handling materials that could cause harm. Consultation visits um, are requested throughout the country in a variety of sectors. Many people might think that OSHA only addresses hazards in manufacturing or construction sectors, but you can see from this slide that in 2023 across the country, those sectors made up a significant per percentage of on-site consultations, but the service sector um, was a, also a big sector that we played a role in. And the, the size of the employers receiving consultation visits. The, the program is really targeted to the small or medium-sized employer. That's um, those that are um, in the case of the majority of visits to, the, to 100, 1 to 25 employees. But we will visit work sites as, with as many as 250 employees if the request comes in. So how does it work? Basically, you uh, decide that you would like to schedule and request an on-site consultation visit. We don't show up unannounced. Um, you might decide you want to be proactive and request assistance. You might be responding to an OSHA um, site visit where they've issued citations and you need help with abatement. Or maybe someone on your staff has been concerned and has complained about hazards to you and wants more um, attention focused on the hazard and sometimes another set of eyes can be helpful. So there's a lot of reasons why you might request assistance. And when you request assistance, as I said, you can define the scope of what you'd like to, the consultant to think about with you. When the consultant arrives, they'll have an opening conference and they'll remind you that if hazards are identified during the visit, you'll be expected to correct them, but you'll have the opportunity to come up with a timeline to do so, and the consultant will work with you every step of the way to help you correct those hazards. You'll then possibly review some written programs that the consultant identifies may be required in your setting or that you have selected for review, and then you'll walk this, the setting and look at the departments where your employees work, and the consultant will comment and work with you on observations and what they suggest you uh, think about in, in follow-up to that initial review. Then there will be a closing conference either that day or after additional data and programs are reviewed where the hazards identified during the consultation are summarized. And you'll come up with a strategy and a timeline for correcting those hazards so that you know when you're done implementing your programs that you've approached them adequately and, and appropriately. And then you'll receive a report from the con consultant and you'll document and get back to the consultant with your hazard correction so that you can close out that scope of the visit and possibly request another visit with another skill set, another department um, to continue on with that relationship. So I'm going to turn it over now to Savita Trivedi, who's addressed a, a number of topics during the visits that she's done to museum and cultural heritage sites. And um, that way you'll get a better sense of what we're seeing as on-site consultants here in Connecticut. So Savita. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Savita. I'm one of the industrial hygienists at Connecticut OSHA. We also have safety consultants. Um, Connecticut OSHA has conducted a few consultation visits for museums in the state of Connecticut. During these visits, we conducted walkthroughs of the museum, noted safety or health hazards um, that were observed. And we also provided administrators with resources that could help them assess potential hazards associated with maintaining and displaying their, their own collections. 
Some of the topics that we addressed are summarized in the next slides. Uh, employees may be exposed to chemical substances such as paints, epoxies, solvents. Uh, this could be while fabricating displays, restoring artwork or artifacts. Um, also, curators may discover that hazardous chemicals are stored on site. There may be old chemicals um, stored on site. To ensure that employers and employees are aware of the chemical hazards at their work site and know how to protect themselves from those hazards, a hazard communication program is needed. This slide lists the basic requirements for a hazard communication program. It, would, it entails having a written hazard communication program, a list of the hazardous chemicals used or stored at the facility, a copy of a safety data sheet. It's a sheet manufacturer uh, that a manufacturer comes up with uh, with information on chemical and physical hazards of, of a substance, um, and also employee training. The OSHA standard for personal protective equipment requires employers to assess the workplace to determine if hazards are present, which necessitate the use of personal protective equipment. Individual job tasks should be carefully evaluated and the PPE or personal protective equipment selected based on the tasks performed. Employers must communicate selection decisions for PPE to each affected employee and ensure that each employee is trained to know what PPE is necessary, how to wear it, care for it, and the proper disposal for PPE. We have also addressed the use of respirators on our visits where respirators are either required or they may be used on a voluntary basis there are additional requirements that employers should be aware of, and those are items we can help you with. If uh, There are also some substance-specific OSHA standards. So if there is a potential exposure for a hazardous material, which has its own substance-specific standard, the employer may be required to conduct an initial exposure assessment for that substance. And in some cases, it may entail uh, developing a resp respirator program or administrating uh, other protective measures. Some of the substances which do have a specific standard are listed here. Um, if, if you're working with formaldehyde, arsenic, lead, um, cadmium, asbestos, those are others that you may come across in a museum. Uh, which may require the exposure monitoring. In addition to the health hazards, we can also address physical hazards in the workplace. When maintaining and displaying collection items, employees may be exposed to some of the physical hazards that are listed on this slide. For example, lifting and carrying heavy objects, working on scaffolds and ladders, hazards associated with work in wood shops, paint booths, and vehicle maintenance garages. So we come across some of the same physical hazards as we might find in a manufacturing facility. And, and we can address uh, machine guarding, electrical issues, um, and other hazards. One good resource uh, that we have that OSHA has come up with is this uh, Small Business Safety and Health Handbook. This is a nice resource to have. It has checklists, different categories of um, hazards and checklists that you can use to assess your own work workplace. Now, every state has a free on-site consultation program, as Anne mentioned. The program for your state can be found by clicking on this map, which is found on OSHA's website, osha.gov. Um, I think this map 
can also be found in the OSHA resources that you received with this webinar. It's under OSHA consultation uh, directory. So if you click on your state, it will take you um, to your state's program with a contact, info, contact name, um, email, phone number, and so you can uh, get in touch with someone. So feel free to contact either Ann or me if you have any further questions. Our website and phone number is listed um, on this slide. Uh, we look forward to the Q&A at the end of today's session. Um, and like Ann mentioned, this is a, a, one of the best programs that OSHA has, and we encourage all of you to reach out to the consultation program in your state. Um, and you can you know, start with a very limited scope of visit and expand it as you like. So I will look forward to seeing everybody at the Q&A and I will turn it back to Robin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great overview of the program itself. So we definitely appreciate you taking some time to talk about it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and now we're going to introduce our second two presenters. Their names are Christina Dillard. She's the Environmental Health and Safety Manager at the Museum of Science in Boston. And Sarah Adams, Curator of Collections from the Springfield Art, this is, sorry, Museum, excuse me, in Illinois. Uh, they're going to talk about a little bit more about just kind of their, their experience with these programs. And um, I'm glad we were able to kind of find some folks from some different states because I think it'll be interesting to kind of see the stories they have to share. So Christina, feel free to share your screen and get started whenever you're ready. Thank you for this great opportunity to share. I'm excited to share some of the things that we um, were, what we learned and how it worked for us. So let me get this. Great. First, I just want to say that, you know, this is a great mission, a great program, and it was a mission that resonated with us that helped us to see that it was going to help us to achieve our mission, which here at the Museum of Science, our mission is to inspire a lifelong love of science in everyone. And in order to do that, our staff have to be safe and they have to be able to work with the public. So before you even decide all of this, whether or not you want to engage with this program, I want to caution that you do want to really be appreciative of who is your point of contact for safety at your institution. That here at the Museum of Science, we have a me. We have an environmental health and safety manager. So while I oversee the safety program for the whole museum, if somebody wanted to bring this program in, they would want to coordinate with me to make sure that we were ready for this and we had all the documents together. But if there isn't someone like a me that is at one of these institutions and you want to do this, who is responsible for the compliance at your institution? Are you affiliated with another institution that might have someone who could start to get you um, going with some of the safety questions you have. So please be sure that you are coordinating appropriately. Um, and then as you're trying to plan this, you know, once you've decided this is it, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get some help and we're gonna decide and define what that scope is gonna look like of the help that we need. Make sure that you know who will be at that meeting, who needs to hear this, who's gonna benefit best from this information. And who authorizes that visit? When they come to visit, they actually do transfer over to you a form that says, you know, that they're authorized to go and be in your facility and look and to help you. And then the final part of that is that, you know, you will have things that will be identified, undoubtedly, that need to be, they need to be need to be changed, they need to be corrected, they need to be improved upon. And you, while you have that time to do it and that consultant is there to hold your hand and make sure it happens and do it in the right way, you need to be sure that you know who is responsible at your institution who is going to you know, make sure that you can fix it. Who's got the purse strings? Who's gonna make sure that if it costs something, we have the money to do that? 
And I don't mean that to scare you in any way because you define the scope here. So if, you know, if the first thing when the consultant arrives says, see, this is a big deal, you might want to say, okay, let's keep this at a scale that I can, I can keep moving forward. So you can do it in small snippets. But our journey here at the Museum of Science looked like this, that we made an initial contact in November of 2022 with the Massachusetts Consultation Service. And we set up an appointment first to have a physical safety inspection done. And we chose to, the scope of the work was to look at our shop. So this is our wood shop and our mechanical shop. And this was to look and do an inspection. And they came in in January and we um, then had a part two, which was to look at health safety. That was so that's the industrial hygiene side of things. And right away um, after this, we really felt that we learned so many wonderful things that it really helped promote for me that we had a great mandatory leadership and safety training for our staff. So it was something that we conducted, but it was while we were in the process of going through and fixing items, we made this training and really expanded beyond even those who came to the inspection. And then the closeout process was in so it was all completed by May of 24 of 2023. In general, it was great because it was a renewed institutional appreciation. Um, and we had a lot of great improvements that were beyond what the requirements were. Now, why did we choose to do this? We chose to do this to make a fresh, dedicated refocus to our shops area. And it is one of the highest hazard areas. Now think about in the shops area, we actually create all of our own exhibits and we create exhibits that we send off to other museums. So we have a very big shop um, that is not, there aren't that many employees in it, but it does a lot of amazing things. Um, and so it is one of the highest hazard areas with everything from a table saw to you know, hand tools. Uh, we have, and it was good for me to have a fresh set of eyes with a voice that wasn't mine. As an environmental health and safety manager, I can tell you that sometimes it's hard to hear my voice because I'm the one that's always telling people the kinds of improvements we need to make. So we looked at our exhibit shops, that's our carpentry, our metal fabrication. We looked at our education shops actually too for our maker spaces. So these are some of the little things that our, um, education staff does and then our facility shops also has a carpentry and a plumbing area as well as some mechanical areas and those were all areas that were looked at and prior to the um, inspectors coming in or not truly inspectors but the consultation folks coming in they actually asked for a number of documents to support what are we looking at and because they were going to offer some assistance to us to make sure that they are compliant, that we weren't missing anything. That's another great fresh set of eyes. They looked at all kinds of things for us. They looked at our emergency action plan, our fire prevention plan, lockout tag out plan, our respiratory protection plan, hearing conservation, um, even our personal protective equipment job hazard analysis. And finally, they do ask, and they will ask for everybody, for the OSHA 300 logs. Have, so have you had any incidents so that they can better appreciate where you might have had some concerns. When they were here on site, they had an opening conference. They outlined their expectations, and the inspection itself was looking at the hazards defined and prioritized and recommending actions right there on the spot. Uh, we made a lot of things that were, you know, recommendations that could be implemented right there and then, which was great. Um, when we were all done looking at our spaces, we broke for about 30 minutes. The um, consult person, you know, what took a space and, you know, went through their notes and then we came back together as a big group. And when I say a big group, that, I included all of our safety committee here. We have 12 members on our safety committee and 
this represents, you know, each one of these active areas, and it also represents human resources. Um, so it was a nice group, and it was good for them to hear um, what the expectations were, what the identification of our hazards were, and some clarifications around what they saw. Now, when they presented that, we had actually had quite a few. Now, I remind you, it was a serious, um, these are serious hazards. These are things we have to we have to fix, but this is also one of our high hazard areas. So we knew that there could be a potential for this. We had 16 um, violations that needed to be addressed. Some were addressed right during that day. Some had, we had to take time to work on. And there was on the health side where we had 13. Um, these are you know things from chemicals to labeling to ventilation, some housekeeping things and you know, the inspections that were being done or even locations of where our eye washes and showers were. So these are things that not, not, not overwhelming, but yes, it did feel a bit overwhelming to have so many things identified. But at the same time, I have to say that, you know, I wanna remind us that safety is this presence of capacity that we make better safety choices um, knowing what our actual problems are, knowing what we need to fix, knowing what we need to prioritize on. So, you know, being able to take this moment to have engaged learning and have that active inspection was incredibly helpful to us. And I'm really glad that we did that. So learning, learning, learning is the key to making sure that you improve. So some of the benefits of this, you know, was that we have some older equipment in our shops and, you know, it allowed us to have a recognition of some fresh set of eyes of some things that we could do to bring it to current safety requirements and to the current safety recommendations, because some of it just was recommendations. And that's great it, to, you know, make things safer. On the chemical side of things, recognizing significant hazards could be present and appreciate some alternatives, such as using these acrylic, um, that these have a potential that they could have methylene chloride and there could be exposure there. So, and, you know, doing the monitoring for that and, you know, looking at alternative ways to do things. We also have a welding area and then that welding area, we looked at some of the things that we weld to look for any steel that was there for a potential exposure to chromium six. So these are things that were good for our staff to hear and think about outside of their normal day. And then there was also the things of, you know, the recommendations of how do you better educate ourselves? How do we continue to have, you know, better formal safety trainings that are in place, better passive learning by having posters up on the wall, by having workstations that have, you know, safety at all at them. And then there was also some of these sustained things that, you know, having programs that get reviewed on regular basis and so forth. So there were some great recommendations that came out of this. And these recommendations and positive reinforcements were really outlined as things that were both about our management and our leadership and how we can improve upon things there. Um, looking at our hazard prevention and control, hazard identification and assessment, and our education and training. And I just have to say, I mean, it was a great program. I'm glad we did it. And it really did help us to have a better sustained program and just focusing on one area because, you know, as Vita said, that one thing is you get to define the scope in what the consultant's going to come out and look at. So you get to decide how is how much help do you need or how is it going to be helpful to you? Let me stop sharing so that Sarah can give you her perspective here. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so uh, I'm Sarah from the Springfield Art Association of Edwards Place and that's in Illinois. Um, just a little bit of our organization for you. Um, we are a, about a hundred year old um, organization. We're a small organization. We have 12 full-time staff members. 
um, but we have a large campus. So when we had this OSHA program uh, consultation come through, we had a wide variety of things that they were coming to look at. Um, and I'll give you an overview of what our facilities are so that if any of these are familiar to you and your facility, uh, it might make more of a connection with you. So the first thing that we ended up having them come out for was for our historic house museum, Edwards Place. Uh, Edwards Place is the oldest home in Springfield on its original foundation. It was built in 1833, and we house all of our collections within this museum. So our exhibits are in the museum, but then our collection storage are also within the house as well. So we ended up having them come out to look at the house initially, but they came um, and that's an interior view of the house, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, but we have other facilities too. We have a mobile unit, uh, the make truck. We also have a gallery um, connected to the house uh, called the MG Nelson Gallery. Uh, so they looked through there. We have a downtown gallery, the SAA Collective, and also downtown we have a library, an art library, which is another location. But then the places that they really focused on uh, were the studios. So we have a 2D studio. Um, it has 2D art and mixed media art. And these are just a few images of that studio space. So this was one of the areas that they really focused on. This is where we have a lot of chemicals and things like that that needed to be checked over. Um, and then our other space is our 3D studios, which include metals lab, a ceramics lab, and a glass lab. And they spent the most time in our ceramics lab and our glass lab. So this is our ceramics lab. The left is just an image of the facility itself. And on the right is where they really spent a lot of their focus. That is where our ceramic tech Maggie mixes glazes. Um, and glazes have silica dust, or some of them do. So we had to have them focus on that a lot in, in the consultation. We also have a glass studio for cold glass and hot glass. And there is some silica in there too, but since it's not the same silica dust, uh, they didn't have to focus on it as much, but there were other issues in that studio, uh, which I will go over in a little bit. So the timeline of the process was actually really quick, all things considered. We started the process in April of 2022. I got a promotional email from OSHA um, that they were looking to do these consultations for museums. And I talked to my supervisor about it and said, I really like to do this. And the initial reaction from staff was that they were a little scared. We thought, oh, you know, we might get in trouble. But I said, no, this is a different program. Uh, I, I think it's something we really need to do. So we sent an email back saying that we were interested. And within a month, we were matched with our consultants. So it didn't take very long from when we showed interest to getting consultants matched with us. And through a little period of time, we were able to have them then come and visit. So between May and August, we set up the time for them to come visit in August. We had two people come and um, tour. We had the health and also the safety people who came and toured our location um, and did the consultation with us. Then in October, that was our due date for all of the corrections that we had. So everything that they told us in August and gave us the report of things that needed to be corrected, um, the due date for those were October. And just a note on that too, when we were given the due date, they told us that if we weren't quite finished with everything by that due date, that we could get an extension. So it wasn't an end all be all end date that we had to meet. Uh, if we had a problem with anything, we could have extended that date. We were lucky that we didn't have to extend it, but that was an option that was available to us. And then in December, they did the follow up visits to make sure that we had been um, all the things that we said that we had corrected were actually corrected. So they came and visited in December of 2022. And then they visited one more time uh, just to tell us our testing results. So we were able to get some testing done for silica dust. And those results were back to us by January. Um, that says 2022, it meant to say 2023. Uh, so by 2023, we were completely finished with the entire process. So in less than a year's time, we were able to have the consultation and fix the corrections um, and finish that. 
So these, I just want to show you these uh, forms just to show you what we were receiving when they came to do the consultation. So after they came to do the consultation, we received these regulatory hazards, um, these sheets that would tell us each of our hazards that we had. And you can see this one shows us the correction date of uh, the end of October. And it tells us the standard that we needed to correct. Um, there's images with a lot of these and they tell you what the potential effects are, what your recommended action should be. So they lay it out really in a, in a user-friendly way so that we were able to do these things. And then what we sent back was an employer at report of action taken. And so it, we told them when we corrected the hazard um, on this, you can see it's at the beginning of October, we corrected that hazard. And it tells us what we what we corrected and how we corrected it and what we're doing to make sure that we don't um, have that correction needed again. So I want to say here just really quick too, they didn't find anything in our historic house museum that needed uh, to be fixed and they didn't find anything in our galleries that needed to be fixed. Everything that they found were in our art studios. So in the 2D studio and the 3D studio, those were where they spent the most of their time. Um, but I want to give you an idea of the th kind of things that they were looking for. So we had safety hazards and we had health hazards. And we didn't have too many on either side of things. Uh, we just don't have a big enough, you know, shop like how Christine was talking about. They have a large shop. Uh, we don't have that sort of thing. So we're much more on a small scale. So the things we had to fix were also on a smaller scale. Um, so this is just giving you an idea of the things that they were looking for, the things that they found, and then what we did to correct those things. So for the safety hazards, the first thing was that the chuck guard on the central machine drill press that was located in our cold glass shop was not guarded. So the potential effects of that could be amputation, contusion, or fracture. And then the recommended action they gave us was to install a chuck guard. So what we did was we purchased and then installed a, a guard for the drill press. And that was one of the things that was, uh, it took us a little longer to fix, not because it was more difficult, but purchasing, um, you know, had to go through to make sure we were purchasing the right thing and, you know, making sure it was installed correctly. So that took a little bit longer. The second thing that was a safety hazard was that our oxygen and acetylene tanks were stored in a connecting storage cabinet outside of our 3D glass studio. The potential effects that they could have with that were burns, smoke-related injuries, and traumatic injuries from fire or explosion, which is very serious. So the, uh, the recommended action that they said was to remove the acetylene tanks away from the oxygen tanks. So what we did was we removed all the non-secured cylinders and we have an agreement with a company, Ilmo Products Company, to remove them in a more timely manner and staff has been informed of the hazard so that that doesn't repeat again. Um, you'll find with a lot of these that staff being informed of what the correct action is was half the battle. So making sure that we were telling our staff what was expected and what they needed to do um, was really a huge part of all of these corrections that we needed to make. So the second uh, visit we had was for health and we had more um, corrections that we needed to make for this than we did for safety. So with the health hazards, the first one we had was that the compressed gas cylinders were not secured to prevent the damages and tipping or falling that occurred in the metals area of our 3D studio. And the potential effects with that could be contusions, fractures, burns, lacerations, or crushing injuries. And their recommended action was to store those cylinders in assigned locations that are well ventilated, dry, and out of pathways that people are walking through. And we needed to protect them from tampering by unauthorized employees and secure them as well. So what we did was that we removed the non-secured cylinders and we have an agreement with the Il Ilmo Products Company as with the previous thing to remove them in a more timely manner. And then staff again was informed of the hazard and informed uh, how to deal with that in the future. The second thing was that the flammable or combustible liquid container was not in accordance with standards. So the effects of that could be risk of fire or explosion by container failure. 
The recommended action was to use metal or approved plastic containers to store the liquid and label them with the correct chemical. So what we did was that all flammable liquid containers were removed from all of our cabinets and staff has been instructed about proper containers for cabinets. This one is an easy fix in a way, but it's something that I think a lot of organizations have trouble with that they're just putting different chemicals in a cabinet without anything labeled or anything. It's something that happened that is common with us, but not common anymore. Um, now that we know we're very careful about labeling everything and putting them in the correct containers. So next is that the eyewash station in the metals area was not being tested weekly. This was an easy fix. Um, the potential effects of that obviously could be damage to the eyes, eye infection. And the action was that they wanted us to flush the eyewash station weekly and document the results. So it is now being tested weekly. There's a sheet at the station that monitors the frequency of testing. And again, it was just one of those things that the staff needed to be notified that that was something they needed to do. It's now part of their regular duties and that has not been a problem since then. The fourth thing was that there was no written hazard communication program. Uh, the effects is that the employees can be exposed unknowingly to toxic material or may use a physically hazardous material in an unsafe manner due to lack of information about the chemical or its hazards. Um, the first date in case of accidental exposure may be correct, incorrect or delayed due to lack of information about first aid and emergency procedures. So the recommended action was to develop, to develop and implement that hazard communication program. So the hazard communication plan was written and staff was given the plan. It's kept both physically and digitally. Uh, so staff has different ways to access that, that program. Um, and that was one of the more difficult things to do too, because writing a policy or writing a plan is never easy, especially when you're kind of working up from, from nothing. We didn't have anything for it. So we had to really build that up. Um, and that kept taking took us a little bit longer, but we were able to get that done. And then the next thing is that there were unlabeled containers of liquids in a flammable cabinet and nearby. So the potential effects for that could be chemical burns to the skin, faces, eyes, respiratory hazards, or skin conditions. And the action that they recommended was that we label the containers correctly and retrain the employees to know how to do so. So we disposed of the bottles uh, or the bottles without the labels and we were instructed about the proper labeling for the items. Next is that there was not a clear policy and the first aid program was required or voluntary. So there was exposure to potential infectious diseases and the action that they recommended was to create a clear policy on the first aid program and to establish whether it's required or Good Samaritan. So they didn't require a response on this one, but we did write a Good Samaritan policy um, to make sure that staff knew that they weren't required to provide first aid um, because we were not providing that training. And then finally, um, and Christine mentioned a little bit about the OSHA 300 logs. We uh, did not have those logs available and you're supposed to have them for five years back. Uh, so the potential effect is that the ability to track injuries and illness in the facility. Um, but then the recommended action was that we maintain and provide the required OSHA 300 logs. So we filled out the 300 sheets and now we keep a record. Luckily, we haven't had to fill out anything bad on them uh, since that time, but uh, it's important to keep up on them so that we are able to give those to OSHA um, if, if anything ever did happen where they were called to our location. So the one thing I wanna um, talk about too is I mentioned that they spent a lot of time in our, in our ceramics lab and they were measuring the silica dust. So one thing that they did with the testing is that they had the ceramic studio tech, Maggie, wear a, a wearable silica monitor. Uh, so she had to wear this while she was mixing glazes and going about her regular duties just as she normally would, um, wearing the PPE that she normally wears and everything like that. So the monitor actually, uh, to the right, it, there's a form that shows how much was um, how much was even found. And there was, there was barely anything found, um, in the entire, uh, time that the sample was being taken. So our silica dust was not an issue, which was really good, but if it was, then we would have had to do something to fix that. Um, they deemed it was not necessary in the glass studio. So we didn't have to have our glass tech, um, wear any of that silica monitor. 
And then this is just an image of what it's like when Maggie is mixing glazes. So when she's wearing the monitor, um, she was in under this hood, which they loved that we had that. That's a good safety measure. Um, but she was wearing it while she was doing that, and they were still unable to really get a huge sample of it. So they were really happy that we were able to still have, um, she was still able to do that without measuring. So I have uh, thoughts about the OSHA visits um, and the top one, they are not scary. These OSHA visits, our staff, like I said, they were, they were a little scared to have them come out because it feels like you're getting in trouble, but we were not getting in trouble for every, anything. What it was is that they're there to help us. So they were there to make sure that we will not get in trouble in the future, that nothing bad will happen to our staff. One thing I really enjoyed was that there was ample time for conversation with our consultants. So we were able to ask them all sorts of questions because for us, we don't have a specific safety person on our staff. So a lot of us don't know a ton about this subject. So we were able to ask lots of questions with our consultants and they were able to ask us a lot of questions about our facilities to get a good idea about what we needed and what they could do for us. They were also careful about looking at all the locations on our campus. So they really took their time going through everything on our campus, going through all of our drawers, even um, that's how they found the unlabeled bottles and things like that in our flammable cabinet. They looked through all of those and they spent a lot of time. Um, it made me feel like they felt like we were important. They weren't just trying to get to the next place. So that was really good too. Most things for us were pretty easy to remedy, and we had good reasoning from them to pay for the more difficult items. So when we had to install um, the guard for the drill press, we had the good reasoning that OSHA says that this is important to have, so we need to purchase it. Um, so we were able to do those things. And then, like I mentioned earlier, the timeline was relatively quick. Um, we didn't have to wait a long time to get this taken care of where it's hanging over our heads. It was under a year, so we were able to get that done pretty quickly. And then we have greater peace of mind. Our staff feels more safe because we had this consultation because you don't know what you don't know. So once we knew what was wrong, we were able to fix the things that we needed to and have greater peace of mind. And I'll stop sharing there. That was great, thank you. And I, I think it was really important, kind of that point you you made, and someone said in the chat earlier, is that you know the entire point of all these programs is to really kind of just prevent uh, illnesses or things that can happen. So it, that's it's really there as more of a preventation, like a, you know just want to make sure not people don't get hurt. And OSHA's there, obviously providing us this kind of a service. So that's great to do. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions. I am going to go ahead and put in the chat a link to our resources page and a link to the survey. Um, the link to the resources includes a link to that map that Sabita had actually referred to that talks about the state offices that deal with OSHA. So I would encourage you guys to look at that. And then also I wanted to, because I promised to put this in here, the link to the 2024 May Day raffle. So that is there as well in the chat. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start asking a couple of quick um, questions before we hit our time. Um, one question was that, could you speak a little bit more about the eligibility for the consultation programs? Um, the website includes that it is primarily for small businesses, but would this preclude federal museum or museums that receive federal fundings from participating in this program? So I was wondering if you could have a little bit more clarification on who can apply. You might, Anne, need to turn off your camera while you answer this, just for your sound quality. Okay, great question. And yes, the program is primarily targeted to the small employer, less than 250, uh, and it is not um, available to a federal employer, although a small employer that receives federal funding for aspects of their um, business, of course, could use our um, our program. But really, the goal of this outreach through the OSHA on-site consultation program is to help that small or medium-sized employer. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, someone just asked a question, which I was kind of thinking about this as well, is, you know, both you, Christina, and Sarah mentioned about how you have these deadlines, right? People, the, the consultants make recommendations, and then there's a deadline given. Um, what happens, or have you heard, or, you know, Savita or Anne, you chime in as, as well, what happens if the employer just won't do the recommendation, no matter how much time is given? Are there any kind of ramifications that come from that? Do you want to respond oh, to that, Savita, sure. or do okay. you want me to? Go um, ahead. When we have the opening conference, when we come out um, the first day for the consultation visit, we go over some of the obligations of using the service. And, um, and that's when we talk about, you know, if we do find any serious hazards, we want that abated in a certain amount of time. Um, and... And it's only when the employer agrees to it that we'll continue. And, and the purpose of that is if we were finding hazards and say, hey, employer, it doesn't matter that you correct it or not, we really wouldn't be doing them any justice. Um, but if we had an employer who absolutely refused to co correct a serious hazard, we could refer, refer them to federal OSHA. But in over 20 years that I've been doing this, I've never done that uh, I'd, yeah, or know of any consultants who have. So we, we, you know, I've gone back to the employer, helped him write a program to whatever it takes to get those items closed out. Um, but but so, so we work with employers and like uh, Sarah mentioned, you could request an extension you know, all of a sudden I have five or six things to do and I'm busy at work. So um, you could get an extension. Perfect, thank you. The goal is a win-win to get things abated and corrected for the sake of the employer and employees and um, we will work with you. Yeah, thanks, Savita. I found it really interesting that both Christina, Sarah, you guys have all had things that were just kind of, maybe things that again, having that outsider's perspective, and walking in, it wasn't like, I don't want to say it was a quick fix, but it was just something that made you kind of go like, oh yeah, you know what I mean? That is something we, we need to do. Um, do you guys each have examples of something like that, that again, was just kind of like a fix that you were like, oh yeah, we should have done that. And it didn't seem, it, it wasn't a huge undertaking to do. I'll go first and just say, oh, one of the easiest ones um, that when our uh, health um, consultant came out and she's looking at our labels and we had you know we had some old HMIS and NFPA labels that we were using we were using some of the new style that had the global harmonized system and she just she said just make it one you know don't try to have people learn two different systems just pick one stick to it you know go with the new one and you know, also when you are using labels, even for things that are non-hazardous, use the same labels, but just add a piece to it that just says non-hazardous. That was such an easy fix, and it was one of those duh moments. <laughs> Ours was really with labeling as well, like us for labeling the items that we didn't have labeled in our cabinets or having them in the improper containers. It was an easy fix then to just be like, oh, of course we shouldn't have these in our cabinets. Of course we should be putting them in, in the correct containers. Um, and the other thing for us was writing the Good Samaritan plan and then also um, keeping the logs because those were things that we just didn't think about doing before. Um, and now that we know we're able to do that. Perfect, thank you. Um, my other question too was, I guess on the flip side of that, were there any large corrections that you had to do that you were kind of like, well, this is going to need extra funding? Um, someone had asked if they knew of a kind of history of granting programs that support funding. So I didn't know if you guys could speak to that point or even just how you approach. I'm guessing it was pretty easy to, to approach your governing authority and say, hey, OSHA saying we need to correct this. But kind of what, what kind of um, argument or kind of funding sources did you find when it came to the larger scale corrections? So for us, we did not have any like very large scale um, corrections. So for us, we didn't have to ask for extra funding or anything like that. So sorry, <laughs> can't help with that one. Totally fine. Christina, do you have any examples? By yeah, chance? we did. Um, you know, one of the things that they recognized was actually not something that was 
directly part of the inspection or the, the consultation, but they looked up and we saw that there's an area that our facilities folks have to access to get to a, um, a ventilation and there wasn't proper um, fall protection up there. There wasn't a proper gate. So we, you know, they recognized that. Certainly wasn't anything anybody had on their schedule of, gee, we need to go purchase that. But as soon as it's recognized, it wasn't even a question of, you know, how do we pay for it? It's just, let's get that done. Duh. You know, it was, so I think it is, it's less about the, the cost and more about having, you know, the documentation to set it as a priority. Um, and even that was not an exorbitant cost by any means. Perfect. Thank you. Well, it is two. <laughs> so that went by very quickly. Um, and I want to give a huge thanks to our presenters today, both from, you know, Anna, Savita, Christina, and Sarah, thank you for giving us, you know, your backgrounds and kind of talking about the program and kind of your experiences with it. Because again, we want to really push that this is not a scary program, it is a beneficial program, and it is there to kind of help uh, small and mid-sized institutions really find these kind of issues that are there, because they're there, right? They're not going anywhere. It's rare that you come across an institution that has no issues, so I think it's really important that you guys, um, this program's out there to highlight it and to kind of help institutions find corrections for the issues, for sure. Um, I went ahead and put links to the 2024 May Day contest or link to our resources and our link to our survey. Um, this program was recorded, so we are going to go ahead and try to put this up on our website pretty quickly. It should, should be by the end of the week. Um, and we will also put up copies of some of the presentations and other information on our website. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we have another webinar next week, May 1st for May Day, so we will see you here. And if you want to register for, register for that one, come to connectingtocollections.org. Uh, thanks to FAIC, thanks to IMLS, and thank you again to all of our presenters today. And we will see you all in just one week. So thanks again. <laughs>